Hello viewers, this is Angela Murjani from Kasturba Gandhi College in Hyderabad and I welcome you to this session in which we are going to study a poem that is extremely thought-provoking. The poem is called Kalahandi. Now Kalahandi is a very real district in Orissa that has constantly suffered the onslaught of natural calamities like drought and the poverty that that brings in its wake. The poem is a typical picture of the deprivation and misery that is the portion of many such villages throughout our country. But what happens in the aftermath of a natural tragedy is even more terrible and it just compounds their misery. When the suffering of the villagers is at its very peak, throngs of politicians descend upon these villages. Opportunist politicians are always on the alert, looking out for a chance where they might promote themselves. Along with them come the bureaucrats and the officials who make huge promises about a better future. And the media is always there when they see or smell a sensational story. However, very soon the politicians, the bureaucrats and the media all disappear. And as the dust settles on the hapless villagers, they find that they are left to their own devices and their own fate to solve their own problems and find solutions that would work for them. The poem Kalahandi compels us to confront this part of our society which has always evoked two paradoxical reactions from the rest of us. Either we are filled with compassion and show great interest in the problems of this section of society or we are totally uninterested and apathetic, sometimes our apathy even leading to complete forgetfulness. At face value, the poem appears to be a matter-of-fact statement of all the problems that are faced by a village that has become the victim of the vagaries of nature. However, if we look at it at a deeper level, it is a sharp indictment of the many systems in our society like government, politicians, bureaucrats, the media and even the common people of India. The poet who penned this work is Jagannath Prasad Das, born in 1936 to very middle class parents in Orissa. After his education, Das served for a brief stint as a lecturer in the University of Allahabad. However, in 1958, he gave that up to join the IAS. He did a posting at Kalahandi, which forever changed his life. And he decided to quit the IAS in 1984 and become a full-time writer. His opinion about life in the IAS and life in general had changed completely at this point in time. Das had begun to write at an early age publishing his first collection of poems in 1951 and he was widely published in local Oriya journals. Of the poets who have come out of post-independent Orissa, Das must be acknowledged as the most multi-talented and prolific. He is a poet, painter, short story writer, playwright, novelist and an art critic whose career graph spans over a few decades. In recognition of his wide-ranging talents as an artist, J.P. Das was awarded the Saraswati Samman. Through all the genres that Das has worked in, he has consistently displayed a unique sensibility. The main themes of his work being the suffering of the poor and the exploitation of their situations by politicians and the media. It has also deeply troubled him that the rest of India that is more well-off has always showed an indifference to the sufferings and misery of the poor. Now let's look at the poem Kalahandi by J.P. Das. Put away the road maps now. To go there, you do not need helicopters anymore. Wherever there is hunger, there Kalahandi is. The god of rain turned away his face. There was not one green leaf left on the trees for supper. The whole village a graveyard. Cracked ground, drab river sand. 
all the plans failed. The poverty line receded further. Wherever you look, there is Kalahandi, in the sunken eyes of living skeletons, in rags which do not cover the frail bodies, in the utensils pawned off for food, in the crumbling huts with untouched roofs, in the exclusive prosperity of having owned two earthen pots. Kalahandi is there everywhere, in the gathering of famished crowds before charity kitchens, in marketplaces where children are auctioned off, in the size of young girls sold to brothels, in the silent procession of helpless people leaving their hurt and home. Come, look at Kalahandi closer, in the crocodile tears of false press statements, in the exaggerated statistics of computer printouts, in the cheap sympathies doled out at conferences and in the false assurances presented by planners. Kalahandi is very close to us, in the occasional contrition of our souls, in the unexpected nagging of conscience, in the rare repentance of the inner self, in the nightmares appearing through sound sleep, in disease, in hunger, in helplessness, in the abject fear of an impending bloodshed. How could we then walk into the celebrated portals of the 21st century, leaving Kalahandi behind? The poem opens with the shocking statement that one does not need a map to find Kalahandi because Kalahandi is wherever there is hunger. Wherever there is deprivation, wherever there is suffering, lack and misery, there is a Kalahandi. Now Kalahandi has become a metaphor. It is wherever human tragedy occurs, there one might find Kalahandi. And the poet seems to suggest that there are many Kalahandis sprinkled throughout India and even through the rest of the world. Stanza 2 paints a graphic picture of the village itself. The poet puts it very poetically, saying that even the rain god had turned his face away from this dreary, disaster-prone village. Why complain of the people when even their gods were not willing to look at them and answer their needs in this time of dire necessity? The whole landscape was dry and parched. The people searched in desperation for one green leaf that they may find it and turn it into a meal for themselves. But there was not one to be found. No, not even one. This was the story of every one of the villagers in Kalahandi. The whole landscape was dry and barren. The village itself turned into a graveyard. The parched earth opened in dry cracks and fissures as if these were graves to receive its own people, now dead. Once a gushing river had flowed through the village, now it was only a dry and sandy riverbed. At one time, government officials and bureaucrats had come to the village. They had assessed the situation and they had made many plans, but none of these plans had been acted upon and nothing of what they had promised had materialized. So now the poverty line was only receding and a new benchmark in poverty had to be established because of the new tragedy of the drought that had afflicted Kalahandi. Stanza 3 reiterates the motif of poverty in this village and describes in graphic detail the picture of people who have been affected by such penury. If one wants to know what poverty looks like, one has only to look at the people of Kalahandi. Their sunken eyes tell a tale. If you look at them, they are like walking skeletons, bits and pieces of rags barely covering their bony frames. The few utensils and other household tools that they might have possessed had long since been traded in for food. Their houses were falling apart, the roofs caving in, barely providing any shelter by day or protection by night. In the abject poverty of Kalahandi, any villager who owned two pots would be considered 
prosperous. In stanza 4, it appears like Das wants to project Kalahandi as a metaphor. A metaphor is a symbol or a word picture which stands for something much larger or greater than its own immediate meaning or context. To Das now, Kalahandi has spread everywhere. Wherever the scenario is the same as in the village of Kalahandi, that is a new Kalahandi. Therefore, Kalahandi is no longer restricted to its geographical location of a village in Orissa. It is wherever poverty is to be found. There are four specific places where, according to Das, one might find Kalahandi. He says that wherever there are hungry, pushing, shoving crowds, trying to get some food from a kitchen established by a charitable organization to assuage the hunger pangs that are eating into their very system, there is Kalahandi. Wherever one may see villagers trying to auction off their children, in that extreme privation, one can see Kalahandi. Living in the relative comfort of urban India, it's probably very difficult for us to imagine that people would be so constrained by financial situations as to sell their very own little children. But the truth is that children are sold everywhere. The sad truth is that in remote and not so remote places in India, and why, yes, even in other places of the world, people do sell their children for cash. Kalahandi may also be found where people are giving in their young daughters into brothels in exchange for money, being hard pressed and not knowing where else to find the money which they so desperately need in order to face the basic requirements of life. When we see that, we know that here is another Kalahandi. Lastly, one can see Kalahandi in those eyes, sunken eyes, dead eyes, eyes in which there is no hope for the future, eyes which hold no promise for a better tomorrow, eyes that are carried by legs that are plodding on, leaving their homes in order to search for a greener pasture. There again, one might find a Kalahandi. In the first four stanzas, Das has painted a very vivid and clear picture of what a drought-struck village and its poor penury-struck inhabitants must look like. But now there is suddenly a shift in his tone. There is a dramatic turnaround and it appears that in the following stanzas, Das wants us to confront the reality of the Kalahandis in our country and in our lives. And he wants to force an answer from us. And it is to the conscience of the reader that he makes the appeal that comes in the rest of this poem. Stanzas 5 and 6 are addressed to us, the readers, to you and me, people who live in villages, towns and cities where the shadow or the clouds of such extreme penury have never been cast over us. We have never experienced such dire want, such circumstances of extreme need. It is to us that the rest of this poem is addressed. In stanza 5, the poet invites us to come, take a closer look at Kalahandi. It suggests that so far we have never come close enough to Kalahandi to be affected by it. We have always viewed it from a distance and that distance has kept us from being involved. That distance has kept us untouched by the sufferings and the misery of the people who live there. Or the poet seems to suggest, maybe because of the overexposure through the media of the situations and the calamities that happen in places like Kalahandi, our hearts have become hard and calloused. Maybe by constantly seeing such scenes, maybe by constantly hearing and being aware of such tragedies, we have begun to see them as something that happens to someone else somewhere else and therefore we have not allowed those situations to touch us or to affect us very deeply. Therefore, 
when we do see Kalahandi on our TV screens, it fails to move us. This verse is a very strong indictment. It is an indictment of politicians, of the bureaucrats, of the media, and even of the people of India. It is an indictment and a criticism of everyone who uses the situations of Kalahandi for various purposes to serve their own ends and does nothing in exchange to alleviate the sufferings of the poor who are really going through these tragedies at a personal and a family level. Das has this against the media that they use these calamities to raise their TRP ratings. They use it to gain the sympathy of the people, to pull on their heartstrings that they might watch more and therefore the TV stations might become more popular. Das speaks at length about the leaders and the politicians who appear on TV at such sites where calamities have happened and they pretend to shed Tears. He calls these crocodile tears. An ancient anecdote tells us that crocodiles cry tears in order to lure their victims to themselves. Or sometimes they cry tears when they are actually devouring their victims. To Das, this seems an apt comparison because these politicians are using the situation in places like Kalahandi only to promote themselves, only to gain favor, only to become more popular. And that's why the poet seems to be really annoyed with these leaders. Das is equally upset with government officials and bureaucrats who appear on the scene pretending to have great sympathy for the people who are suffering. They make false promises of a better tomorrow, but seldom do they work out those promises. Seldom do they do anything to materialize the plans and the concepts which they talk about. The sympathy which they display costs them nothing because they give nothing from their own pockets. They simply make false promises and appear to be doing their job while in reality they have no intention of doing anything for the poor denizens of Kalahandi. Those dear villagers know it well. So their eyes remain empty of hope for even though they have been spoken to by politicians, leaders and bureaucrats, they know better than to expect anything from them for the future. In the final stanza, Das is looking at you and me. What is your response to Kalahandi going to be? He seems to ask. What am I going to do to help the people of Kalahandi? Is what he wants to know. There seems to be, according to Das, two different reactions, two typical responses of people when confronted with this situation of natural calamity. In the first response, according to Das, some people feel very bad about what has happened. They have a deep sense of regret and remorse for the sufferings that their fellow countrymen are going through. However, this operates only like a nagging conscience and it's too fleeting for it to last. When an emotion like that comes only occasionally and only at long intervals, it cannot be acted upon, so it remains at the level of feeling and never gets any action coming out of it. Therefore, this nagging conscience serves no purpose at all to the people who are really suffering in our villages. According to Das, the second response comes to those people who want to push Kalahandi out of their consciousness. It comes in the shape of nightmares. When we are sound asleep in our beds, safe and contented, far from the tragedies of life, when we think that those circumstances will never come near us, suddenly the cries of our less fortunate people come to awaken our sleep and to bring a sense of discontentment into our otherwise peaceful lives. Our troubled nightmares speak to us of thoughts that we have successfully pushed down into the deep recesses of our minds. There are the cries of hunger pangs that rend the air. The anguish of disease that has assaulted, but no help seems to be at hand. Fear looms over like ominous dark clouds, unsure what new trauma they hold in store for those who are already plagued with difficulties. And then there is the bloodshed. 
what may bring about a fresh rampage of people killing their fellow men who knows in addition to the natural disasters there are the fires the riots the bomb blasts the never ending saga of man's inhumanity to man all of these comprise the sense of impending doom that hangs over the villagers of kalahandi the poet then asks a very pertinent question it is a question that every indian needs to ask themselves and answer in private the truth is that whoever we are whether we are politicians bureaucrats business tycoons or ordinary common people we all take great pride in the progress that india has made We all love to talk about the improvements that have happened in India. We want to talk about the increase in the gross national product, the better standards of living, improvements in infrastructure, technology and international trade. All of this is true. It is true that India is moving forwards and onwards. But here is the question. Are we going to walk into this new era of technological progress of never before revolutions in abundance of food economy trade without our brethren from Kalahandi because the truth is the progress that we are making has not touched them at all it has not come anywhere near them the same poverty the same privations the same lack of educational facilities the same disease all that was with them before is with them now so the question is india are we going to progress forward leaving these our brothers and sisters behind is that fair this reminds me of what the metaphysical poet john donne once said in fact he wrote a poem about it called no man is an island He expresses the idea in this poem that whatever happens to one person will affect the total population of that place. No man can go through an experience and the others be unaffected by it. We are all interconnected socially, politically, religiously, familiarly in every way we are all a network of human beings so if india is imagining that one part of india can progress and leave behind one section of our population there is something very essentially wrong with this thought and concept right from the root the poet sees something essentially wrong in india's neglect of huge populations in kalahandis that exist all over our country how can we progress into the portals of the next century if there are pockets of people who are still going through deprivation and disease the onus however dear listener is not on any politician it's not on any leader the responsibility is ours yours and mine as the educated leaders of tomorrow it's going to be up to us if we want to see an integrated india if we want to see india whole if we want to use a holistic approach we've got to find ways and means to bridge this yawning chasm between the kalahandis and the cities and towns of india it's up to us so from now on dear listener we better think of a way we better put on our thinking caps and find a way how we can integrate the rest of india and bring it along with us so that this progress that we are enjoying may be enjoyed by all of our people as one unit